it's an incredible honor. He's going to give this talk in English, and the following one in Marathi. So, sir. Friends, and today I am going to talk about cosmic illusions. That means, uh, as an astronomer, you look at the sky and you see stars, or in the daytime you see the sun. And what you tend to believe, or assume more or less, is that once you have seen it through your telescope or whatever you are using, uh, that is re the real situation that you are seeing through that device. But sometimes what you see is not what really there is. There is a discrepancy and that is what illusions are meant to suggest. You have heard of uh, the Snow White and Seven Rock story in which you start with this, uh, what you call the, the Bad Queen. Uh, she thinks she is the most beautiful woman in the world and she, how does she verify it? Uh, she asks her mirror, that means looking through the mirror what you see uh, is what's the, what is supposed to be there. So <coughs> here what you are seeing uh, is uh, something which is not very complementary to the person who is looking at the mirror. You see that it look, looks like a uh, very strange kind of composition a long neck and uh, in, in general uh, it is very uh, different from what actually is. So here you are having illusions which are not cosmic but which are local because on the ground, uh, hard ground and you are looking at it just across. <coughs> So let's go to the next slide. Now we also have illusions on the earth uh, in different forms. Uh, you, you can have, uh, here you see uh, what looks like a lake which has got trees on the bank. And it's supposed, it looks like reflection of the uh, tree uh, in the water. Uh, in reality, uh, this is not what is happening. What you are seeing are uh, certainly reflections, but not in water. Uh, this is a, the picture of a mirage. That means in, on a, in a desert, when you uh, look at it from one vantage point and look all over, <coughs> there may be situations like this, where the uh, water-like water appearance is caused by the reflections that you see. So how do the reflections occur? Because the light rays which are coming towards you. So imagine I am standing here and there is a uh, source of uh, object like a tree there and I am I'm, I'm trying to see it. Normally here on the earth, in a normal... <coughs> <coughs> In a 
normal situation, the rays of light will come straight to me. And you know that light travels in a straight line. That is what we uh, have tested in the laboratory. So we... Thank you. So we uh, assume here that light is traveling in a straight line towards where we are, but this straight line is not quite straight. What happens is that see the temperature uh, of the air above the hot, hot sand. sand, you find that the uh, hottest part is below, then it starts cooling up upwards. <coughs> so you can appeal to the laws of refraction, where the light is bent when it goes from one medium to another. So this is what is happening, the light is bending and when it reaches to you, your eyes, it's coming at an angle. And so you see the image, not at the level, but at the bottom. So let's see whether we can go further. we come to this situation in a different location, just as you have here in the mirage, hot sand, uh, if you go up in the atmosphere, you reach uh, media which are very cold. So you are essentially looking at uh, a gradation uh, in which the upper you go, the uh, colder the medium is. So when you look at this kind of uh, medium, uh, and if you are up there in like an astronaut, then what you will see is similar to the mirage, but you will see upside down uh, situation. And you might wonder whether there is something really strange going on there. Actually, the only uh, unexpected thing is the bending of light coming from one medium to another and similar to that in hot sand. Can I go to the next? was a question which Isaac Newton posed to himself. Uh, this is in connection with the law of gravitation. As you know, Newton's law of gravitation, which I am sure you have uh, heard of in your textbook, and in that uh, you have the situation that any two objects in the universe attract each other and that attraction is according to inverse square law. So this uh, inverse square law tells you how to uh, describe the attraction of between any two objects in the cosmos or in, the, in your neighborhood. <coughs> so Newton asked himself this question that if it is happening to all bodies. What about light? Does it also bend light? So now you can see that light is a, it's 
something which in Newton's time they did not know exactly what light was due to. It was much later when people re came to know that light is a form of electromagnetic wave. That is a wave which has got electrical and magnetic fields changing up and down. So uh, he therefore uh, posed himself this question, uh, is light bent by, uh, by the <coughs> gravity of a very massive object? Let's look at the next slide. Here what you see is a object that looks like a uh, star. Of course, stars are not uh, hexagonal or this kind of thing. We, so it is just a notation that we use. So the stars are spherical. But if you take that, uh, you see a ray of light going to the right. Uh, and here you have uh, two possibilities for the light. If the light ray is passed, uh, and possibilities because the light is coming close to a massive object which is shown there by a greenish sphere. <coughs> so the question that we are asking is, or which Newton was asking, is the following, that there are two alternatives. One is the blue alternative which is a straight line going uh, without any notice of the attracting body. So it means that the attracting body does not attract light. Okay. This is one aspect and the second possibility is that it is aff affected by law, law of gravitation and that ray of light is bent by the object underneath and therefore uh, it looks curved path. <coughs> so Newton had this question which he uh, called, uh, he used to uh, be very precise uh, about what he knew and what he did not know. For example, uh, when people ask him more about law of gravitation, wh what it is due to, uh, assuming that the law of gravitation works, so why do things attract each other? <coughs> so N Newton felt that uh, he does not know the answer to this question. And to tell you the truth, even today, we don't know the answer to the question. Why objects attract according to the law of gravity that Newton had given later modified by Einstein. But still we don't know what is the basic cause. And so, uh, in case of Newton, uh, he had put this question, uh, which, which is the right one, is the uh, light ray bent by a gravita gravitating object or is it not bent, does it go on straight? So this question, he put it as query one in optics, he wrote a book on optics which is light properties of light. <coughs> so you can imagine uh, the following situation that he was uh, posing himself question and asking what the answer should be. The answer he has to experimentally verify. Uh, that is Simply saying, yes, it is, it is doing it because of that, that is not the scientist's method. Scientist's method is to perform experiments and test a particular hypothesis. So this is what uh, 
Newton was in the process and throughout his life uh, he did not know the answer to this question. Now, <coughs> now it is always tempting when you don't know the answer uh, to a question you have a guess guesswork answer that is you think that this is because you think it is right you go on saying that this is the uh, answer to that question but if you use the criterion that experimentally what you say must be verified then of course simply saying this is happening because I think so or he thinks so that is not the situation. Let's go to the next. So, So le let me now come to a question, situation much later than Newton. Uh, in 1915, uh, Albert Einstein had uh, a law of gravitation different from Newton and it was called the general theory of relativity. Now uh, his argument was that uh, theoretically, that is if he did look at the theoretical work that was the foundation of relativity theory, one could solve this question and come to the prediction that yes, uh, light is bent by gravity and to what extent it is bent that also can be calculated by relativity. <coughs> but as you know, uh, we have to be sure uh, by experiment to uh, confirm what we are guessing because even if you uh, go back to Einstein's conclusion that light is bent by gravity you could ask him how, how do you know so he said he, he would have said that he has the theory of relativity which tells him that. But then you could ask him, but how do I know that theory of relativity is right? That theory may be wrong, so you may be getting the wrong answer. So this can be settled only by an experiment. And here what you see in the picture, uh, two people are talking, uh, sitting on a bench. <coughs> Do you recognize any of them? These two people. Uh, I, I thought you would recognize one of them because his picture is very common. gentleman sitting here is Einstein and so I, I would expect you should to recognize Einstein's picture when it is shown uh, in some context or other. Uh, this, this is another scientist whose name was Eddington, uh, Arthur Stanley Eddington. He was a professor in Cambridge, Cambridge University. And here you see Einstein visiting uh, Eddington and they were chatting in on the, sitting on the bench. <coughs> so here, when as a result of their, their discussion, 
what came out was the following. Uh, what Eddington suggested was that we could have uh, a experiment set up like this, that if you uh, take this, the, a star which is very far away, and between the star and you, uh, there is a uh, possibility of the sun going, because uh, we, we are observing the sun and the sun goes round the earth, uh, which, which is the same thing as earth goes round the sun. <coughs> now here, what Eddington uh, suggested was that when the sun comes in a position where the ray of light from the star to you uh, is intercepted by the sun's path, then what happens is you we reach the situation that I showed in the picture earlier, that there is a massive body, which is uh, the sun, which is bending the ray of light coming from the star to you. And he, sa he said that when the uh, sun goes past, that bending will stop because uh, there is no, no longer any close distance between the path of light from the sun and uh, and the massive body which is the sun. <coughs> so we come to the uh, conclusion which Eddington said that uh, if he got money to, con uh, to perform an experiment, uh, he would do the following. Uh, he would look at a star with whose ray of light is sometimes the sun comes very close. Now you will ask this question that if the sun is there in the sky and the star is just behind it, how are you going to see the star because the sky is so bright? So the answer to that is you, there is a sh brief period in special cases where the uh, ray of light from the uh, star uh, comes through the, uh, the sun, in the neighborhood of the sun, then what you are asking is, how am I going to see the star behind? And the answer is, if the sun is covered, when is the sun covered completely? It, it is at the solar eclipse. So Eddington said that in 1919 there would be a total solar eclipse and I would go and measure it uh, wherever there is eclipse. Uh, you can see here uh, on the right hand side at the bottom uh, there are certain stars and uh, the sun is shown like a uh, sphere uh, that is covered. So these positions of these stars, some of them <coughs> can be measured and one could then compare with, with the non-solar eclipse case uh, on a situation where there is no uh, nearness of the sun uh, and the ray of light. So what happens is we get into this situation that uh, if we do the experiment exactly at the total totality of the eclipse, we will be able to see changes in the shifts of the star because the light is bent in one case and not bent in the other. So let us go to the next one. Can we go to the next slide? So what happened was uh, Eddington went, uh, sent two teams, one of which he himself captained and the other one uh, he g gave to another uh, senior astronomer <coughs> and 
one team went to brazil and the other to uh, an island near uh, uh, called principe uh, in uh, africa so near africa so uh, because from those positions uh, eclipse would have been total and seen very uh, clearly so he did this and then make made measurements and came back and reported so at that time uh, the, the uh, news was very uh, shattering that uh, uh, the uh, ray of light can be bent people did not think that ray of light could be bent but here uh, the an whitehead was a distinguished scientist <coughs> who attended the meeting in royal society where eddington presented his results so he says the whole atmosphere of intense interest was exactly that of a greek drama we were the chorus commenting on the degree, degree of destiny as disclosed in the development of a supreme incident that means they were all all scientists knew that what eddington is going to tell is going to be very very important but there was in the background the picture of newton uh, to remind us that the greatest of scientific generalizations was now after more than two centuries to receive its first modification so what he is saying that people were aware that there was the big picture of newton in royal society now that because newton was supposed to be the uh, best or biggest scientist uh, around now what we are going to see was that some of the things that newton said were wrong or could be modified Uh, and einstein was providing that uh, result so this was a very important situation so ne- nearly two decades later another astronomer called fritz zwicky it's very hard to pronounce this name you, you start saying rapidly fritz zwicky fritz zwicky you will find you will find it is not so easy <coughs> and the astronomer also was a bit a bit difficult person he got into trouble by uh, controversies with all well known astronomers uh, but one of the things that he said was very correct and that was <coughs> now here in this picture you see Zwicky sitting at the telescope and watching images. His ar- argument was that when light comes from very distant galaxy, uh, it can be bent by massive object on the route to us. So you are seeing something coming towards you, but in between there is a massive object which is bending the light. and so you are not seeing exactly what what is there but you are seeing something which is uh, in a sense uh, distorted or illusory <coughs> so when he said this uh, nobody took notice of it uh, partly because uh, he, as i said earlier Zwicky had uh, fought with all his colleagues so nobody wanted to cooperate with him so his idea was not try the one people didn't even look for it but by chance uh, some 40 years later 1979 see Zwicky said this in 1937 so nearly 40 42 years <coughs> so uh, he said 
uh, and that's what happened was people uh, began to see double and even more let us see what yes the, the first one they saw in 1979 1979 was uh, a pair of quasars. Now quasars are very bright objects, very bright in the sense that uh, a typical quasar will, will emit light as much as a big galaxy. But the quasar is concentrated to a very small uh, dot. Now people saw a pair of such quasars <coughs> and the astronomer has a way of giving uh, numbers to, to all the objects seen by him and the numbers are such that they help you to locate that object. So this 0957 plus 561 means uh, just as on the earth uh, if you are given a map and asked to find a particular city or something, uh, if you are told that the coordinates of the city, the latitude and longitude are so and so, then what you would say <coughs> is I will go along the longitude circle and go to that latitude where the object is expected. So, Similarly, uh, the uh, astronomers in the sky, they like to give coordinates uh, and these coordinates are 0957 plus 561 for the two objects. Uh, just to show there are two, they call this A and B. So 0957 plus 561 A and same thing B. So here you see two images on the left hand side, two round circles and their spectra were, was taken, that is the light was analyzed at different wavelengths, just as sunlight is, can be analyzed to give you seven colors, with your with violet, indigo, blue, etc. Similarly here you can do it with uh, quasars. And what you see are the, uh, on the right hand side, you see the graph drawn from the spectro, spectral measurement. So, people then asked why is, and what they found was, both these quasars were exactly similar in their size uh, and luminosity, how bright they were, etc. Their spectrum was very similar. So it looked as if they are, uh, what, what they call them, like twin brothers or twin sisters. They look very much alike. So since these quasars uh, were similar, uh, very in appearance and properties, they were called twin quasars. That means uh, similar to twin brothers, twin sisters. Then later what they realized was that the two quasars cannot be so similar to each other. So what they were seeing were uh, two images of one quasar. So how did this happen? You see here, <coughs> object and you are looking from here and you are trying to you are seeing the light coming this way and that will produce an image here and similarly some part of the light can come on this side and it will produce an image here now what is making that distinction in between there is a massive object who is, which is bending the light. So when it is 
bending it bends like this so it bends like this so this bending and for is producing two uh, image now you can say that uh, why only two why not more more because it could come from other uh, dimensions that is instead of lying in this particular plane it could be above this and below this so you could have in fact a ring of any uh, images <coughs> and indeed astronomers when they started looking they found there are such things around so let us see whether we get anything uh, like that so this is uh, how we have formed the two images explain the two images uh, i just ma mentioned to you this the way it so here on the top side you see there is a lens and when you see something from the lens uh, you can get uh, a bigger size or smaller size depending on what kind of lens you are using so <coughs> in the case of gravitational lens what happens is as you saw that the gravity acts in all the planes and so you can get more than two images and here you see something which has got four four images and with the original in the middle <coughs> so you can get multiple images and you can get exceptionally bright quasars because they are bright and quasars or galaxies because they are brightened by the uh, uh, phenomenon of bending of light <coughs> you see here uh, a <coughs> situation which is very unusual saw how one can get four images from one then you can have uh, this sort of uh, figure where certain parts are much brighter than other and this brightening is caused by uh, gravitational lensing then you can have a situation where you can have a whole range of objects which are gravitationally lensed <coughs> and they might be originally in a straight line but they get bent so you get a uh, bending effect which is uh, this, this is for example uh, as i mentioned you can get a whole ring of objects this is how these are all real images so uh, what we can do uh, that uh, we we can ask in are, are there various ways in which this phenomenon can be seen so in 1978 even before the idea of gravitational lensing became popular uh, myself and a friend of mine colleague of mine Uh, we had suggested that the distance between two components of a quasar separated by several light years may be amplified by gravitational bending uh, of the rays by an intervening galaxy so here you see the picture the intervening galaxy is the blue one <coughs> and the image uh, original source size 
and the image is the image is bigger than the source so what happens when the source starts moving the two bits of the uh, source the two ends they move away from each other and they go with the speed something like uh, 10 10% 20% sometimes even 50% of the speed of light but <coughs> what you see are not those, those motions but the illusion the gravitationally uh, bent uh, light rays coming from that those two ends and so you see the image which is much bigger than the source and so the two bits are moving away grip faster than light you know that normally the relativity theory says nothing can move faster than light but here you see them moving and the answer why this is see so because light ray has bent and therefore what you are seeing is not the real motion but uh, illusion <coughs> here you see this typical picture a and b are the two ends and a star b star are their images the distance between a star and b star may be much more than the distance between a and b and so when a and b move away from each other the and sim what you would see actually are the images a star and b star moving faster than light so this is what we had predicted and has been found so <coughs> so one can say uh, that gravitational lensing on a smaller scale like that by a, a small star uh, can also happen uh, and that leads to a very interesting situation supposing you have got stars in a neighboring galaxy and you see from the left another star going to the right so when you go like this uh, at some stage it is precisely located with respect to the background stars so some background stars get <coughs> get into a lens like situation where the light from the star is bent by this star which is going in front which is shown by red arrow and when this happens uh, you see a sudden uh, rise in the brightness of a star so this way is uh, it is it is seen like that so gravitational lens uh, can be simulated how does gravity act that is shown uh, by Uh, actually making a lens with a with glass or better still transparent plastic material so that uh, makes it uh, very uh, interesting <coughs> another interesting point with which i will uh, end my talk here uh, is about uh, distant objects supposing you are I, i show you some this glass which i am holding this looks very small to you from a distance if you if i bring it closer and closer to you then you will see that the glass is uh, actually look appears bigger so the farther you are the smaller you see the object uh, this is shown here in terms of so it is shown uh, here that there are some animals grazing and the size of the animal and the size of the tree line in in the background looks similar but the animals are not uh, as big as the, as the trees and the hills are even bigger but they also look of the 
comparable distance. So this is part of uh, seeing things from a distance. And so uh, in Euclid's geometry, you know that the angle subtended by an object at your eye uh, gets smaller and smaller as the object moves further. So you can show here, this is an object which you are seeing from the left. Then as, as the object moves, the angle subtended by it to the leftmost point, which is shown in the picture, uh, that in decreases. Which means as the object moves further, the size, apparent size becomes smaller. So, uh, this is what you expect from your everyday experience. But what happens in astronomy is that uh, the ray of light which is coming to us from a distance, it gets bent because of gravity of matter which is present all, the, all over. <coughs> and because of that, the distant object look bigger rather than smaller. So it shows that one has to be uh, uh, careful when one takes into account the fact that the universe is expanding and things are bigger, you may see uh, different to what you expect to see. So one could say, uh, what is the expanding universe? Uh, it is one in which distance between any two galaxies systematically increases in the same proportion everywhere. So you see a balloon on which there are dots uh, made. As you blow up the balloon, the dots move away from each other. And this is how the galaxies move away from each other. So one can therefore say that spectroscopic evidence suggests that <coughs> the expanding universe is happening and in most models of this type the angle subtended by a distant source of light may actually be larger than the angle subtended by a nearby source. So that may means the further the source is the bigger it looks which is very strange. Uh, so the question is, has this been tested? The answer is yes, but the attempts so far have been very ambiguous in their conclusions. There are uh, many, many sources of possible error or confusion, and so one has to be careful in dealing uh, with this data. So. Let us hope that a definitive conclusion in this regard may be possible soon. So, however, there is enough evidence today to caution the astronomer that seeing is not necessarily believing. Thank you very much. So, uh, sir, sir is willing to take questions from you. If you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, Shivom will come to you with the microphone. Do you have any questions? Either you have understood everything or not understood anything. So <laughs> Are you 
feeling shy because see this is this is a very rare chance that you get to ask a scientist about the question that he himself or he or she uh, are researching and the question may have also come to your mind so that's that's a great thing that you are thinking on similar terms <laughs> anything that any doubts in the presentation <coughs> don't feel shy <laughs> In, in in any case if if you have some problem understanding what i said or uh, anything else you can send me an email with a question and i can reply as as, as necessary uh, my email address is uh, jvn@ayuka.in it's very simple jvn at uh, ayuka i u c a a dot in i n so you can be more free in asking question by email okay so uh If you are still thinking about questions, let me just quickly make an. Uh, oh, lovely! There's a question. <laughs> Good morning. Go ahead. It's on. Good morning, sir. Uh, sir, I have a question that you said. Uh, Speak in it louder, yeah. Sir, you said that uh, the universe is expanding. What is making it expand? what is making the universe expand uh, this is a question to which honestly we don't know the answer the answer but, <coughs> but there are two or three possible uh, solutions or possible suggestions i would say one is that there was a big explosion what they call big bang when things were produced in the in the universe and because of the explosion things are moving away and that is what we are seeing so this is one possibility the second is that <coughs> when if the universe was very small then it may have a kind of behavior which cannot be understood by newtonian dynamics that you study at uh, uh, in school or uh, at uh, higher classes but uh, one could argue that uh, instead of uh, newtonian thing there is a quantum mechanical behavior at very small size so imagine the whole universe being very small sort of inside an atom and something happened uh, in the quantum mechanical rules and it started uh, blowing up becoming bigger but this is again a uh, sort of guess work we don't know the answer the third possibility that people talk about uh, that the universe has not a beginning or not an end but it keeps on generating matter in a steady way there are some uh, mathematical way of describing this production of matter without without uh, violating the law of conservation of matter and energy but they are bit too complicated to describe here thank you sir uh, the question sir due to the mirages that we, that as you said that we observe so uh, are the measurements that we are taking of heavenly objects are they distorted or is there any error in the measurements is there any possibility 
due to the atmosphere you mean uh, no because of the uh, mirage is like what was told so mirage happens in the atmosphere because of the air so do you mean because of the air in between us uh, do the observations suffer or yes and also due to the gravitational lensing okay so th- that was mentioned by sir anyway the gravitational lensing is a miraging a mirage kind of effect so this yes we do have that i'll just pass on uh, the question to sir any uh, astronomical object that you see the is seeing involves l- light coming through the atmosphere so there can be some defects effects which are produced by light coming through a moving atmosphere or so on but they have been properly es- estimated and they can always be corrected the twinkling of the stars that you see that is because of our atmosphere not the stars are not twinkling in the <laughs> in space i just wanted to add that but as, as you said mirages in space is what sir was talking about till now with all the gravitational lensing is a kind of a mirage in space because of uh, not because of air but because of gravitation is there a possibility that it may stop expanding or it will just go on continuing expanding forever uh, so so the question is if the universe is expanding <coughs> if it is expanding then will it continue expanding or will it stop well <coughs> the we have <coughs> present observations which show the expansion going on but we have no other data to compare at what will happen or what did happen it too much it that has to be guessed or extrapolated from what we see you know it is you have to have a theory to tell you what what it did or what it will not do but we cannot uh, observe them basically we are seeing the present now <laughs> we need better o- observations which you guys can do at some time <laughs> in the future with better equipment that astronomers are making now <coughs> we'll take a last question there you told about the quasars and you told that there were two images and not a pair of quasars uh, then how do you find the exact location of the quasar or th- which was the main source you see what you have to do is make a model of what you are seeing a geometrical model in which uh, you say what are the relative distances and so on how much is gravity bending those lights so very elaborate models have been constructed which then tell you what the original quasar must have been like and what it looks after uh, illusion that means through gravitation gravitational lensing so <coughs> the answer is not very straight forward but it can be handled with la- elaborate calculations excellent so you all have to also practice mathematics and physics if you have to get into astronomy <laughs> astrophysics well uh let us uh, uh appreciate that uh, professor nalikar has taken the effort and uh, despite his slightly ill health he has uh, given his lecture standing here and interacted with all of you so just realize that scientists are normal people like all of us and any of you could become a scientist as well and we all have ill health as well 
so despite that he has come here today and uh, given this this uh, given us this excellent talk let's uh, thank him again with a big hand <laughs> thank you very much sir um, we will have the next lecture uh, again in february and we'll be sending you the letters very soon uh, so the teacher should also note that we have uh, let you will have letters coming about the competitions which will happen in uh, february the national science day related competitions the national science day itself will always as always be uh, celebrated on 28th of february so be please be uh, marking that date on your calendars so that you can bring all your students to ayuka and uh, uh, look at all the exhibitions etc that we have here on that day so thank you all for coming here hope you have a great year ahead uh, you can please exit now and uh, we'll let the marathi students come in there are snacks outside of course don't miss them while going out please get, uh, go out this door and go to the right side where the there's a lot of snacks for all of you <laughs>